Yeah, we're, we're live now. Okay. All right, so we're going to get started now that we have the live stream working. So Daniel was trying to issue a link ahead of time for the event, and then we were trying to connect into it. it didn't go so well, so we bailed on it. But we are live under a different link than we advertised, which is kind of fun. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. I know we've been a little inconsistent lately with our, uh, our meetups. We're going to get better at that, so... Um, we're going to make sure that we're doing the regular time and location. So tonight we're doing Lightning Talks, uh, which is our kind of community engagement uh, small talks. So anybody who's working with mobile, if you want to get up here and talk about what you're doing, talk about your experiences, you are more than welcome. We'd love to have you come up and share your experience. Uh, so our regular time and location is the third Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. here at Hacker U. I've got it as 483 Queen Street West, uh, but we kind of go back and forth between next door where Mark went at first and here, just depending on which room's available. Usually we're at 45, which is this unit. Um, so yeah. Um, next month we'll be doing another Lightning, Lightning Talks Part 2, March edition, we're calling it. <laughs> Um, so we'll be back in Tom. either the space or next door, probably this space again, and uh, we'll do same kind of thing. So if you've got anything you want to present, in you know it could be a small thing where you come up here and load up an app and show us what you've done. It could be a, a concept that you want to demonstrate or like some code you've written or whatever. Uh, come up and share your experience. We'd love to have you. So that's again, uh, Tuesday, March 19th. Um, then yeah, call for speakers, pretty self-explanatory at this type of point. Um, if you wanna connect with us, we're basically all over the place uh, with social media. So um, Daniel and I manage the Twitter stream. Uh, of course, we're on Meetup and we've got a GitHub repo with a bunch of stuff in there. So if you wanna check out um, of apps that we put in there, some demo code, some projects here and there. Uh, it's all under Toronto Mobile Developers. Of course, our live stream is under uh, our YouTube feed. YouTube only allows you to have vanity URLs when you have 100 subscribers, so please subscribe because we're using a tiny URL uh, link right now because we can't use a vanity URL. And the URL that YouTube gives you is like, it's basically a GUID. It's not very user friendly. Um, yeah, much like our WhatsApp link. Uh, we've also got a small WhatsApp channel. I should replace that. Just realized that now. Uh, we've got a WhatsApp channel that uh, you're welcome to join. We just have small discussions in there, talk about you know, what we're working on, things back and forth. It's a nice little outlet and a lot less formal than like maybe Slack or something like that. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, BSI Labs. BSI Labs covers the venue and the food and some of our equipment with uh, streaming and things like that. So thanks to BSI Labs. BSI Labs will help you accelerate your mobile development projects and we're a full service enterprise mobile development uh, shop. Um, and you can find us on Twitter and at bsilabs.ca. Uh, of course, we always plug our um, sibling meetup, the Toronto.net meetup. Uh, so they're over in the financial district I believe Mark's got half this presentation um, coming up at the next at next week's meeting, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, some Azure Paz stuff, and um, I think, Mark, you're going to talk about how to become an MVP? Yeah, some of the things to, you can do to become an MVP. Awesome. So, yeah, if you like Mark's presentation tonight, you should go see him again next week. Yeah. I have some good tips. 15 years, so. Awesome. Um, okay, these slides are slightly out of order, but I'm Dylan Barry. Uh, I'm one of the I'm the founder and co-organizer co co of uh, Toronto Mobile Developers. Daniel's, of course, the other half of the, the duo here that we organize this and get everybody together. Um, if you enjoy what you see tonight, please tell your friends. Uh, I invite everybody who would get something out of this. Uh, so now I'm going to start off with our first uh, really quick lightning talk. Um, I kind of phoned it in, I'm not going to lie. 
Um, I had big ambitious plans to put together a presentation right after I got back from vacation and I got back from vac vacation and went, ah, you know, there's enough. There's enough other people that I can kind of phone it in. So even this particular topic that I like culled away everything else down to, I went, ah, I'll just go over the highlights. So um, I was gonna do Xamarin Forms tips, uh, really things I've learned from using Xamarin Forms through the years. Instead, what I'm gonna cover is just highlights from the last few releases. Um, so this was good for me to revisit too because I'd forgotten that some of these were in there. I went, oh yeah, right, that was in there in 3.1. Um, we actually had one of these things come up uh, today during one of our, uh, one of our uh, uh, scrum calls. Um, so let's quickly just run through this. So uh, Dave Ortno, who's the, the project manager over at, or program manager at Microsoft, looking after Xamarin Forms, is doing a great job with the team there. They're, they've got um, a nice six, weeks, six, six week release cadence where they're pushing things out the door faster and then a nice, relatively stable package. I don't know if anybody, who's actually using Xamarin Forms on a regular basis here? A few, Scott, no, still? Fine, but not professionally. All right, so um, if you haven't checked out Xamarin Forms, you should check out Xamarin Forms. Uh, if you're not using it professionally, I don't, I don't know why you like to hurt yourself. Um, it's just, it's at the point now where Xamarin Forms is, seems like the obvious choice from from my perspective anyways, um, particularly with uh, the 3.0 release, the 3.x releases have been so much more stable. They've gotten rid of a whole bunch of like pain points and you can just move a lot faster now. So let's go through some of these. Um, the first one, uh, bindable span. So this was, if you're decorating a label, so if you've got a label in your, in your code and you wanna add some formatting to it, you can now bind to the span parts of your label that define different formats in your label, so that's great. Uh, Android bottom tab bar, we know that mater material design always had the tabs at the top and they switched to the bottom. Um, that happened a while ago, Forms was lagging on this, you had to have a custom renderer to put the Forms on the bottom. Uh, again, for those of you who don't use Forms, that means you had to drop out of Forms the abstraction that sits on top of the platforms into a platform specific renderer to make it draw the, the tabs on the bottom. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, so that's a nice win. Uh, the entry and editor, uh, you can now control the button type, whether you get spell check or auto capitalization enabled on those fields, just from a quick little flag toggle. Um, you can make the editor auto size your text change, so it'll actually grow as you're entering, entering text. So it'll start, you can make it start out with one line and grow as you're entering text, which is really nice. Um, you can change the switch and slider color. You can um, force the web view to evaluate JavaScript. Uh, the list view now has a selection mode of none. I know I always had to handle this. It was a pain always to bring in a piece of code just to always have it disregard my selection when I'm using a list view for navigation. Um, in 3.2, uh, swipe gestures are now recognized so you can hook into a swipe command. So hook a command to a swipe gesture on your device. The next one, navigation page title view. Uh, if you're familiar with, um, or if you'd like to learn a little bit more of this, there's a, um, an article that Andrew Heffling from the Rochester Xamarin Group put together uh, around the page title view. It basically means the little title view at the top of your screen um, now has, you can now control anything in there. So you can put all kinds of custom controls in there. You can put your own back button in there if you want to like mess around with that. Uh, really powerful feature and uh, adds a, a bunch more flexibility to the platform, which is great. Um, span gestures and commandable regions. This is kind of going back to uh, what I talked about on the first point. If you've got a span, you can now do stuff with that span, a little more granular control of your strings that you're laying out in labels. Um, you can control your, your entry caret position and color, which is useful. Um, editor placeholder and placeholder color. You can, oh, the, the next one, the on platform and on idiom XAML extension is really good. So as you're writing your XAML markup code to define uh, what's gonna be laid out on screen, you can have specific sections for if this is a tablet or if this is a phone. Um, it's just a, a really nice way of, of defining that. 
you had to use all kinds of weird hacks before for that. Uh, buttons now have paddings, which is great. You can put uh, rounded corners on a box view. You can set your label line height so you can have better typography. All good stuff. So just like some of those annoying things that you had to drop down the platform specific to actually adjust those things are now bubbled up to the forms level so you can write it in one place and have it work on both platforms. Um, some more stuff around the label, so some text decoration and max lines. Uh, an image button, which I didn't think was a big deal, but whatever. Um, you can bind your automation ID, which is useful, uh, particularly if you're, um, well, automation ID is one of those interesting things if you don't care about accessibility and do care about UI testing, um, this one's useful. And uh, XAML compilation, uh, it gives you a little bit better granularity on your error messages when you're compiling XAML and something goes wrong. Um, 3.5, this is the biggest one on the list, uh, not just kind of saving the, the most important one for last. Bindable layouts is huge. I don't know if anybody, uh, there's not a huge amount of people in here using it, but I know I had a repeater view that I used to drive around with me, um, or various hacks to get like little small um, binded sections of UI elements on the screen. Um, but now you can bind to a stack layout, you can bind to a flex layout, you can bind to a grid which is very, very useful. Um, it's something that's kind of been absent from the platform. It's really nice that it's there now. So you don't have to use list view for everything. Uh, I have a question about the web view evaluated JavaScript. Like, yep. Couldn't you do that before too? You could, but now it's, it's bubbled up to forms. So it's actually, you can force it to evaluate JavaScript from the forms control, the forms abstraction of the web views. Oh yeah, I thought you could do it from the forms to like it. I actually haven't used this, so. It was called Evaluate JS, and then you just put your JavaScript inside. This is this was lifted from release notes, and some of these I've worked with. This one I have not worked with, so you might want to take a look at that and actually see how it's how it's functioning. Yeah. Because um, I know there was something there before. I only used it once before, like a while ago, so I haven't touched that in a while. Um, I don't know if it's different or um, if something significantly changed. Either way, if you're interested in that, it's just in the release notes on the on the site under 3.1. You can find it pretty easy. I remember it was a pain to get the bottom tab bar done. Oh yeah, that was a huge. <laughs> one. Everyone wanted to do it, but I remember the the bottom tab bar. Like um, doing it with a render was if you, if you weren't doing anything too fancy, it was okay. Yeah. But then as soon as you were doing something with like. You always want to use like glyphs, right? Like icon fonts. And when you start getting that kind of stuff going on and then transitioning between the tabs, it became pretty painful. Yeah. So that was a nice one. Uh, any questions on any of this? No? Yes? Good. Uh, 3.6. So this is um, basically what's marked as going to be part of 3.6. Um, some, uh, some better tab index for both platforms, which is great. Uh, Read-only entry property, I know this is something people have been asking for for a while. Uh, that one's probably gonna be in there because it's already completed. Um, Android WebView Zoom controls, which, sure, if you're using WebViews, embed in your, in your app uh, heavily, I, I'm sure that's a helpful thing. Uh, pin source for map, I know that's another one that was really missing from the, the map controls. Um, there's a lot of things mi missing from the map controls. Hopefully they, they're continuing to add to it. And slider drag events and commands so you can actually attach to interactions with the slider, which is great. And if you want to look at the roadmap, it's up on, on GitHub under Xamarin Forms. There's a whole bunch of stuff constantly being added there. Um, I didn't say anything about 4.0 here, but there's a lot coming in 4.0, collection view being like the biggest one. and um, probably Shell being the other biggest one. Um, so those are interesting. And uh, this is this is it for me. Anybody can, have can any? Can you talk a little bit about the Shell view or if you don't know much about it? Yeah, Shell's kind of interesting because the, uh, Dave Ordno put out a, a survey on Twitter, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, asking, the survey was all about Shell. And basically, here's Shell, what do you think of it? please give our, your stream of consciousness is kind of an interesting way of, of evaluating um, what your thoughts are on Shell. 
Uh, it's basically a way of setting up your navigation structure in like a one page. It's almost like um, a XAML sitemap is one way I could I could say uh, one way I could describe it. Another way I could describe it is um, a drawn abstraction instead of a native control abstraction. It's kind of those two things married together. So um, it's all centered right now around material design. So things aren't actually rendering in native controls. It's drawn controls on screen. And you can also define your, your, uh, net, your application's navigation in one XAML page. So you have your, your app.xaml that defines basically how you're going to structure your tabs, how you're going to structure your, um, your master detail, if you're going to use a master detail, all in one, one document. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. I haven't used it enough. Um, it's one of those things like, it's like everything in software development. Until you start using it and actually build something, it's hard to really get a, a good feel from, for how it's going to work and where the edges are and where it's going to break and what's going to be difficult. So, um, yeah, that's all I got on it so far. Anybody else touch Shell at all? Mark, have you touched it yet? I haven't touched it yet, but I heard it to help developers get up and running faster. That's, that. yeah. Uh, targeting enterprise developers. Yeah. So, just make it a little bit easier to get up and running. It's a, some of the concepts in there are really good. Um, I really like being able to find the navigation in one area, like kind of like a sitemap. Or, but um, the fact that it's mixed with non-native kind of makes me go, well, what what problem are you are, are you solving there, right? Yeah, I think it's just getting people up and running fast. So I, I know, guess so. It's a main point. Yeah. Uh, getting, getting started with that. Yeah. And maybe this might solve it. Yeah. Uh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna hurt. I. I can't see that. I, I think from my perspective, it's the mix of uh, a concept like having navigation defined in one place with a uh, like kind of break from Xamarin Forms traditional approach. Because yeah. Xamarin Forms, for those those of you who, have, who haven't used it, Xamarin Forms basically is a an abstraction that's on top of each platform's native controls. So you've got your Android native controls and you've got your iOS native controls and they take, if you think of it like a Venn diagram, you've got iOS, you've got Android, where they intersect, those are the uh, controls exposed in Xamarin Forms and you can use those to build in XAML or, or C Sharp um, a UI that will look the same or look similar and behave similar on each platform, but it'll still be native. Um, Shell is like a little bit of a departure for that where things are being directly drawn on screen, like more of a flutter type of approach. And uh, that's a departure from the way Xamarin Forms has always uh, really worked. Yeah. So, kind of you can see it too. I think it, yeah, I think yeah, it is, I'm yeah. sure, but it's similar to flutter. Yeah, like yeah. So. so it's kind of interesting, yeah. yeah. Two, two different big, big changes yeah. uh, coming in potentially in 4.0 with, uh, with Xamarin Forms shell. All right. Any any other questions, comments, anything? Daniel, you're up. Okay. Hopefully we won't break the stream too bad. Oh my, my cable man. Yeah. Like forty percent. So uh, my name is Daniel. I'll uh, be presenting uh, uh, something that uh, I've been doing on BSI, a uh, few challenges that we faced on a current project that we're working on. Uh, it's basically how to start uh, data in, uh, in our app, right? So as I said, I'm Daniel John Kauser. I've been a developer for about eight years. I'm a, a blogger and a contributor to the Planet Xamarin community. I'm a Xamarin cert certified developer. 
I've been a, a, a Xamarin uh, focused developer for about three years. Uh, you can find me at uh, Daniel Kauser, my Twitter account. And I do have a blog, as I mentioned, called Kauser Exception. It's pretty funny. Yeah, pretty funny name. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start uh, by explaining uh, how uh, most applications, uh, like client applications, deal with uh, regarding database. Uh, so especially on, uh, on mobile applications, we rely a lot in SQLite. So SQLite is the, the, the DB engine that is most used in the world. It's cross-platform. You can spin it up on basically anywhere you want. Uh, it's also open source. You can find it all about it. You can find the binaries, and you can find the, the C code at, at uh, sqlite.org. Uh, there's actually, uh, this is according, according to uh, sqlite.org, but uh, as of today, there are over a trillion SQLite database that, databases act actively in use. So if you do have a uh, application in your, in your phone uh, and it's using some sort of uh, offline data, I mean, if your phone is offline and you're uh, dealing with data in your phone, you're probably using SQLite to handle that. Uh, and it is the main option for databases for uh, Xamarin developers. So what does starting up data means? So uh, it's basically uh, as soon as your user is logged into your application, uh, you have to have all of that 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 user's data ready for that user to uh, basically use your your phone, right? So uh, it usually starts when the user logs in and you fetch all of that uh, data for that subscription or for that account. Uh, this uh, part is very critical, uh, starting up data, because it basically will dictate the acceptance of users to your app. Uh, you really want to have uh, startup time less than five seconds. For business applications, you could uh, uh, raise that a little bit, because sometimes a user might have a crazy ton of data, and uh, it might take some time to fetch everything from server. Uh, especially if these databases have a big schema or uh, as I placed there, it's like a list of lists of lists. So you have, uh, I don't know, a product that has a list of, uh, so you have a list of products that has a list of orders and those orders have a list of receipts. So uh, usually when you have very uh, structured uh, databases, you, ha you, you usually have to pull all of that down and have it ready uh, for the user to start using, right? Uh, and another case is when you have master detail, master tables like control tables. Uh, I don't know, maybe a list of addresses or a list of countries, something that will never change and it's usually pretty big. In our case, in our app, we have a few like a list of uh, fertilizers, like it's a list of products that will never really change and it's a huge amount of uh, information. Over 10,000, 20,000 rows for that table specifically. Uh, so we've uh, had some trouble uh, with the performance, startup performance on our app. And uh, this is an overview of the process that we thought uh, that uh, would solve this issue of starting up this, all of this data in the, in the phone. Basically, uh, uh, as soon as the user is, uh, logs in in the app, your app would send a request for a database, not, not pooling the data uh, via a, a, a RESTful application. I know you, you request uh, uh, that information for a few certain endpoints that will handle that entity. Instead of doing that, fetching uh, lists of data uh, to many different uh, 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 actions or controllers, endpoints in your backend, we actually request the, the database itself. Uh, so the app will request the database to an API. The API will check in a file system or somewhere that where it's storing uh, files 
if there is a SQLite file for that user. If it exists, it just returns the database and the user proceeds. If not, the, the API will itself generate the SQLite file and then make it available for the, the user to download. And then the user will proceed uh, to the home page of the app. So uh, downloading the, the, the SQLite, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, uh, for a crazy amount of data and a very complex data structure that you might have, uh, your file might not go over 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes. And currently on the, the internet that we have, usually it's pretty good to download a file like that in a few seconds only. Uh, now generating the SQLite on the back end, it's actually where the real challenge was for me, for us. <laughs> uh, it will, uh, I'll, I'll jump, I'll dive a little further into that in the next slide. Uh, so, uh, going further on the SQLite generation on the back end, uh, again, the request will be, will be received by the API. Uh, the API will create a file, uh, just a, a normal uh, empty file.db. Uh, on, our, on our case, uh, the API will query all of the tables on the uh, SQLite on the MS SQL uh, and then it will uh, for performance we're, we chose to use ADO net just uh, writing the queries uh, ourselves and, and running those queries against the, the database uh, then uh, the next step is actually normalize and convert uh, that data into uh, SQLite data I mean types differ, right? So uh, a varchar in uh, MSSQL is a text, uh, is a, so a varchar type in MSSQL is a text type in SQLite. So we do have to translate this information, these types of data between the S SQL uh, L, uh, database and the SQLite. After that, oh, so another thing is like, not only make it, uh, not only the translation part, but also uh, make the data compliant to a certain uh, SDK that we're using, uh, built by the Azure team. It's supposed to uh, make uh, offline handling on uh, Xamarin applications easier. But uh, this uh, SDK, it actually uh, translates uh, 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 data types in SQLite into different types that only this SDK understands. So for instance, uh, by the way, that this SDK uses to version the data between the server and the client, instead of being a, a native by the way in, SQ, in SQLite, they converted it into a stream. So uh, we had to go through and actually check, oh, what data types are this, uh, is this uh, uh, Azure SDK actually using? So we made some tweaks to make it, to make it work. After that, after uh, normalizing and dumping all of the information in the, the SQLite, uh, in the SQLite uh, file, we create the actual uh, table structures in the SQLite file. Uh, uh, then we send the SQLite to a... Uh, to blob storage, Azure blob storage, but any real uh, storage, like file storage would uh, be of use. It's just uh, to basically uh, leave your, your files over there. And then uh, we send the URL for that file to the app and the app will download it. So uh, this whole process might look like a lot uh, of processing, but since uh, the server, like we're relying basically on the cloud power to, to generate and to run all of this, uh, from a sync, uh, initial sync of data between our apps and, and the user subscription that it was taking about a minute, minute and a half, we were able to load uh, in less than 10 seconds. 
just by uh, telling the API to generate everything and dump it, uh, download it uh, back to the, the phone. So it was a major win for our team to see actually like such a performance uh, a gain uh, after doing that. Uh, so uh, what are uh, what are presentations without demos, right? So I built a POC. It's pretty vanilla. I'm gonna I'm gonna just loop through everything. Uh, so I I have I'm just gonna loop through all, all everything we saw. I'm gonna loop through it, and I'm just gonna jump through all of the steps in code actually that we've uh, that I've done for this demo just. To show you guys, so, yeah, this this puppy is connecting to the to an uh, uh, aspect core API over here. Uh, I'm gonna delete the local SQLite file right now, and then I'm gonna send a request to the API. The API will create it, and and I'll download it to the phone. It's generating, downloading, and there it is. Right now, on this list, there's uh, 240 uh, items. I've, uh, I've used this little, uh, I've used this uh, little like JSON generator on the web that's so nice you can tell how, much, how many JSON uh, rows that you want. So my model is pretty simple, it's just an ID and a name, but I could easily uh, uh, scale this up to over 10,000 records. And it's basically the same. Like it's pretty, pretty performant. Ooh, there it is. All right. So right here on the phone, I'm gonna open. This is the Xamarin uh, project. For those who are not familiar with it, uh, this is the basically the the project structure. I have a core library. Can you zoom in a little bit? Zoom in. Oh, damn, yes. Uh, it's uh, command plus. Should be able to I don't think it zooms on yeah, the. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Like the resolution here is way too damn high. <laughs> so I basically have a core library just to hold uh, the, uh, the entity itself, just so I can share it between the API and the Xamarin project. That's one powerful thing of uh, Xamarin that, that you actually can share code. So I don't know how you guys, uh, 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 in other projects that you have worked on, but uh, usually you would kind of have two classes for representing this, uh, this entity. So one in the API and one in the, in the, in the client uh, application. But here we can just share it between both projects, so the API and the, the Xamarin app are both using the same entity, and you can share more codes, not not just this, not the, just this. You can share logic and other things as well. So I'm gonna not show the API right now. I'm gonna show. All right. So this is a little messy, but I've used Reactive UI to. Uh, because I'm learning it, so I decided to do this demo with it. Uh, basically, this is the command to download that we saw uh, the app. It will fire up a uh, dialog, and it basically says preparing to download. Then we send uh, a request to the API. Uh, I have this service here that downloads, and, and I also have uh, I'm actually inside this service, I'm using a, a library called HT, HTTP transfers, which is awesome. It, it is uh, developed to download things on the background. So it gives me a percentage depending on the size of the, the file, it will give me a percentage of how much uh, it's still uh, to download the file, like 20%, uh, 100%. And this is uh, basically, I'm just, invoking that uh, change of text in the main thread so uh, the UI actually updates and not like updating it from a, a back, uh, background thread. It could cause troubles. Don't do that. 
don't update your, your UI in anywhere that it's not the UI thread, the main UI thread. Then after that, I, after downloading the SQLite, I, uh, I'll, I'll retrieve the data from the local uh, list. Uh, here is a down, it's uh, to delete the, the, the local uh, SQLite. Let me enter this puppy over here. Okay, just real fast. This is basically, uh, uh, this is not the prettiest thing ever, but I have a flag that gets set when the, the download is done. And then I'll, I'll, I'll release the, the code. So while the load is not completed, we will uh, have the, the UI, uh, well, the, the process running. <laughs> uh, here I'm uh, fetching my uh, API over here in my, in my Windows machine on the parallels. And here I'm uh, actually downloading, uh, setting up the HTTP transfer tasks to download the file. Uh, that's it for the app. Now let's go uh, to the API over here. I can just show it over here. So let me go controllers. Okay, so this is the action that receives the, the request to generate the, the SQLite. Uh, first, as I mentioned, we uh, will fetch data from uh, uh, MS SQL that is hosted on my, uh, on my Windows machine as well. Navigate to implementation. <coughs> <laughs> Just entering here real fast to show you the code. Uh, hard coded query. This is much more complex if you're trying to go generic through all of your entities, trying to figure out what are the table names. Here I only have one, so I gave myself the 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 ability to just hard code the, the table name. Uh, opening the SQLite uh, connection, reading. Uh, uh, retrieving the reader from the ADO net. Then over here, I'm mapping the, the results from MSQL into actual uh, uh, instances of an object using reflection. I'm here uh, looping through all of the, the results, uh, checking. So right here, I'm actually uh, not only fetching the data, but I'm also uh, uh, picking up all of the properties of the class, all of the properties that I want to create on SQLite. So there's the data and the actual uh, schema that you're gonna create on SQL, on SQLite. So, I don't know, a lot of classes that we have, if you're mapping to entity framework, you might have a list of other entities on the class itself. Uh, you don't want to create a column called list of, uh, I don't know, people in your SQLite table. Uh, you only want the primitive uh, uh, types like int, string. So you make sure that you're fa grabbing all of those and creating them back to uh, SQLite. Uh, yeah, so on this uh, service, I'm returning a tuple of a list of properties with a list of data that I, I just retrieved. Uh, okay, back to the action on the controller. After fetching all of that, I have a second service that actually creates SQLite tables and populates the SQLite database. I'm going to navigate to it by, yeah, not fun navigation on on Visual Studio for Mac. So <laughs> uh, that's the method uh, executed right after querying uh, the data and, and the properties from uh, MSSQL SQL. Uh, here again, I'm hard coding the, the queries. I have this, uh, I have the, the ability to do that. I don't want to, I mean, so the, 
the translation between MS SQL and SQLite. It's not 100% finished yet. So uh, again, trying to map one to one is uh, kind of tricky. So I just hard coded the create uh, statement and the insert statement. It's pretty simple. Like I'm using Frank Kruger's library called uh, SQLite-Net. It makes our lives really easy when fetching data from uh, local SQLite. Without it, uh, without that library, our lives as mobile developers with Xamarin wouldn't be wouldn't be the same. So, beginning transaction, executing, uh, uh, executing the insert statements, and then I'm committing everything, uh, committing all the transaction. Then this is what is just test fetching everything just to see if it was all good. Uh, yeah. Now back to the, the, the controller again. Uh, and then finally we upload the file to a blob storage. Uh, this is code is pretty straightforward to upload uh, things to uh, Azure blob storage. Uh, this is it, the to do DB that was just uploaded a few minutes ago. Delete this guy and just run uh, run it again so you guys see that I'm not lying. My <laughs> demo is working. <laughs> uh, I have Swagger over here. It's pretty nice, uh, Swagger. Uh, it's pretty easy to hook up to your ASP.NET Core APIs. Uh, I should try it out. Is it created? 200, 200, all good. It should appear here sometime soon. Yeah, there it is, uploaded. Hey. <laughs> yeah, so that this is basically it. Like it's a simple uh, POC. Uh, this has been a great uh, uh, challenge to to actually have this POC uh, ready for uh, production. It has been a learning curve to me to understand the inner working of uh, SQLite and how to improve uh, user experience in our, in our app. So this, de this demo was using basically like the mobile client, was built using Xamarin Forms 3.5, the latest and greatest. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, I'm using oops, HTTP transfer tasks for Downloading uh, the SQLite in the in the app and having uh, a lot of control over it. HTTP client just to send a request to the API. So the API I'm using ASP.NET Core uh, 2.1, latest and greatest, and in the framework uh, just to to do the initial mi migration and create the database. I had to use uh, uh, migration. So I'm also using ADO Net. Uh, and SQLite 1.5, both in the mobile uh, app and on the API. Uh, so what is next uh, of all of this? So uh, I've, uh, we've identified that there's a major opportunity for the creation of an uh, open source library for this. Uh, basically creating a, a database out of uh, another database uh, from MS SQL to SQLite. It seems that a lot of that translation between data and data types is not really available out of the box. So we had to do it all of, our, all, all of it ourselves. So we're thinking of starting a uh, NuGet uh, uh, project, like an open source project to uh, basically solve that issue. Uh, just copying one schema into another and migrate all of the data. And it's not just like the select star that I did, like you actually have to filter that data out. Like you, you I mean, you do have to filter uh, by subscription or by user ID. In a lot of times, it, this query might be complex because you're not only fetching table per table, but you do have to fetch data uh, like using joins because a lot of uh, tables do not have a reference to a user account itself, but it's linked to data that is linked to a user account. 
So you have to be able to uh, fetch all of this graph of data and actually copy it all over into uh, some, somewhere else. So it might be a cool idea. We're still thinking of the details of how it could be. And of course, like we do call uh, uh, for helpers. If, you're, if you have a GitHub account and you want to join us and just uh, start some conversations on some libraries that we already have and some that we're planning on doing, just feel free and join us. So there are some useful, useful links that uh, for this presentation, uh, sqlite.org, my Twitter, and my GitHub account. Uh, this demo, this, uh, this presentation will be on my GitHub account as well as in the Toronto Mobile Developers GitHub account. So if you want to grab this code and run it yourself, modify, play with it, feel free. That's it for me, guys. And Thank it's you. On blog. Uh, and it's uh, yeah, and it's on my blog. Like I just <coughs> posted, uh, I just started this week like a series of blog posts that will cover not the the simple thing of the POC, but actually the very details of what we did uh, to to all of the uh, granularity of details that uh, this uh, OSS library is going to take and that it took to actually build it. I can maybe show it to you guys real fast. Yay. So it's just a part one of the, just basically uh, placing all of the goals and all of the details of what the issue is and what's the proposed solution to it. Giving all of the libraries that are used and how this is gonna be better like how this approach to uh, solving the issue of starting the data in your, your client uh, applications, uh, how that, how this will solve that issue for you. Uh, yeah, this is just an overview and then in the next post I'll be going deeper into uh, what the solution is. So yeah, guys, that's it for me. Thank you. Sorry? What data for populating the so let me grab it. So what I did is uh, I ran the so I ran the initial migration to create my data and then I I used entity frameworks as a seed method to uh, okay. yeah so uh, after that I once the model is creating, uh, Entity Framework will call this method called seed. Okay. And what I did is I, I have, I've, I've placed on the project this uh, big JSON payload that it's basically a copy of my, uh, of my uh, data structure. Okay. And I, I, like I read this file, turned, uh, converted it into uh, uh, actual data, uh, yeah. actual wow. instances of, uh, of uh, of the class yep. using Newton soft JSON, and then I use it in any framework to insert everything. <laughs> okay. So it, there's so there's this. Uh, is it this 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 is the JSON generator that I uh, used. Like you can basically build any uh, data structure, like any JSON structure. So you can like create your own particular uh, need and you can like create thousands of rows like here it's only gonna create like seven of this complex uh, JSON structure but like I can easily type over here like 10,000 and it will generate like 10,000 rows of this puppy so it's awesome it's awesome like to stress test stuff yeah. like it's really cool cool thank you yeah you're welcome so any questions guys I just Said goodbye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Come on, Samir. Having hard to beat that. Or possibly beat that. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want the charger? Um, it's one of the older ones. It's okay. I think. I, yeah. Okay. Cool. So where does it go? Is it uh, HDMI? No, it's not. Um, Which one do you have? The firewire of this one? Yeah. Anyone have it? I don't think so. I have it on Android. Uh, sorry, on Google. 
Hey, you can use mine if you want. Yeah, 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 dude. You're having a demo or something? Or? <sighs> I did have a demo. Oh, check, there's a few uh, <laughs> adapters over there. See if any will. Yeah? yeah? Dude. So, uh, who over here has had to deal with accessibility? Anyone? Accessibility, while development, two people? It's not bad. So, okay, today I'm going to try to help. Wait, let's see, Dylan. Dylan, have you ever? Did it just die? He's still working here. <laughs> the live stream is streaming. Yeah, the live stream is good. Don't worry about people uh, in the room. Watch on your phones. <laughs> Let's, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, Dylan, had you ever had to do anything with accessibility? I've had to do a little bit, but not a lot. Okay, so today, hopefully, 
I can help show you guys some stuff about accessibility. So this will come towards the end. Um, and presentation. Present. So I'm Samir Mansour. I have been working with Xamarin for the past two years. I've mainly done Xamarin native, done a little bit of Xamarin forms professionally. Um, but mainly focused on Xamarin native. Uh, there are a lot of major companies that are using Xamarin native. Uh, some Verizon, I don't know if you guys know of it, Spectrum, like there's a lot of big names and really highly rated apps that um, are using Xamarin, and which is a really good thing. And, um, and so there's a huge demand for Xamarin developers. Um, I just moved from the United States in June, and uh, comparatively, it's still growing over here. But <clears throat> today, I want to talk about Android accessibility. I was supposed to uh, speak last month, but uh, circumstances, <laughs> really <laughs> terrible ones. <laughs> yeah. And so um, accessibility, there's basically two main, two main functions when you're trying to make an application accessible. Whenever you're developing something, there's two things that you have to keep in mind. Only two things. The first thing is, is that user able to see all the information? Is he able to gather all that you're trying to tell that user from that application? So if you have a bank app, is a deaf user able to use it? You know, like is he able to see everything? Yeah, so that means a deaf user would be able to see it. You know, is a colorblind user able to see it? So the first one, like I said, is gathering information. Is um, is a blind user able to, to you know gather the information, like see his balance, you know, make a transfer? Um, the second thing that you had to keep in mind is, are they able to perform the functions with, that the app allows you to do? If you're making a paying a bill on the app, are the users able to pay a bill through the app? or are the users able to make that transfer? So just two things that you have to keep in mind. First one is see all the information. Second one is able to perform the functions. So <clears throat> where does accessibility, you know, where, where what, what lays down the framework for accessibility? Sadly, we don't really have a, a unified mobile, um, you know, sort of organization that decides what constitutes accessibility. And we follow the web, the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And uh, basically Apple and Android, they've just gone through all those guidelines. There are like so many pages and pages of them. And they have decided, okay, you know, in order to meet the gu guidelines, here, these are things that we have to take care of. Because we're not a website, so we don't have to take care of all of those guidelines. There's just a few. And here are some of them that, uh, or at least like the major ones. Very simple, easy to read text. Not everyone has a 2020 eyesight, you know? And imagine if this text was blurry. Like, you know, would you be able to read it? No, you'd be like so annoyed. You would barely be able to read it. You know, you'd be like, this is the worst app ever, you know? So accessibility doesn't only have to do with like blind people or you know people with uh, hearing impairments, and it's it's for everyone, you know. Kind of like ramps when you're going to a hospital. Not not only people who you know have uh, a wheelchair use it. Older people use it too, you know. So it's it's always about a lot of things put together. Third thing, <clears throat> dynamic font sizing. For people who are, have weaker eyesight, generally they will increase the size of the font on their, phone, on their phones. And so a lot of times we don't develop apps to where when you increase the size, the, uh, the, all the fonts in the app also increase size. You know, it, it'll be like um, every, the entire app has like large fonts, but then your app has like the tiniest font, you know? So that's definitely in, inaccessible. Um, also, sometimes you know we overlook because um, the font size when it's larger, the font will go outside the screen. So 
definitely people are not able to read it, so your app is inaccessible. And then <clears throat> there's guidelines for minimum tappable buttons or icon size. This is something that we usually overlook. You know, if there's a button or an icon, like an information icon, you know, there there are guidelines that say this is the minimum you should have. And for iOS, because we're doing Xamarin, so we kind of um, you know go for the most conservative one. And iOS has a 44 pixel diameter uh, minimum requirement. So if the information icon is smaller than 44 pixels, it is inaccessible, and you know you won't get uh, you know you won't get kicked out from the app store, but it's inaccessible, and it's it's like you only have to do a few things in order to be like one of the accessible apps and you make people's lives so much easier, the people who actually require this. <clears throat> Minimum contra contrast ratio. So for black and white text, the, the contrast ratio is 21 is to one. I'm not 100% sure where they come up with the math for it, but that's basically what it is. And so there are, there is a minimum contrast ratio for fonts against the background. You know, you cannot have green and then dark green, you know, like gr uh, like green text on a dark green background, like that's the worst, especially for colorblind people. Um, and then enable talkback. So <clears throat> talkback is a functionality that is most often associated with accessibility. Uh, Dylan spoke about Xamarin forms trying to make it more accessible for users and they were mainly speaking about talkback. There might have been a little bit about dynamic font sizing, but it's primarily about talkback. And usually, um, more often, people use the two terms at the same time, when obviously, clearly, they're not the same. You know, accessibility is a, is a whole wide list of things, but talkback is just one part of it. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to dig into talkback because it's something that um, it's the more challenging one of them and uh, if you guys want details to any of them like the links and things like that I have it in the notes of uh, the slide so how do you activate talkback on your device so <coughs> initially talkback was just an app that you download but starting June 21st of last year they made it a part of the Android accessibility suite you, you download the app under accessibility suite and then it gives you that uh, it gives you the ability to check talkback in the settings so you just go to accessibility and it'll say talkback and you can just check it and you're done you know so um, that, that's why it's also like number three trending <laughs> but um, essentially you know if, if you don't have the app you just download it and then you'll be able to see it in the settings. And, and this is true for all modern Android devices. Um, for TalkBack on your emulator, I know most of you use Visual Studio, and you're actually able to get TalkBack on your emulator, and this was a huge thing. We didn't know if this was possible, so when we were able to do it, we were like, whoa, that's so cool. All you gotta do is go to your tools, device manager, you get to your device manager, edit that device, and uh, allow Google Play Store. You know, so this is the, are you guys able to see it? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, you see how some of them have stuff next to it and some of them don't have anything next to it. So the ones that have Google Play next to it are the ones that you can go to the Play Store and basically download the Android Accessibility Suite. Um, so that's basically what I was saying. Now, basic gestures, when you, when you have an app, when you have your talkback turned on, there's some basic things that you can do to go through it. It's, uh, you know, they, they, can't, they, they can't see, so they don't know exactly where to go, so they basically have to scroll through one, the items one at a time. I will give you guys a short demo of what it would look like. So basically what I did, go to settings, accessibility, I'm gonna turn the volume. Is, is the volume turned up? I 
But that's, <laughs> that's Max with sound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's sound. Sound, oh yeah, that's true. Output. Yeah, just internal speakers. Yeah, internal speakers. Yeah. All right, cool. So, it's going to play the audio as if I'm using. Settings and list of items. So I, I. It, it gets really annoying when you're doing like a talk back when you're doing a an an accessibility story. But if I press left on my keyboard, it's like you're swiping left. So I'm going to press left right now. So it like reads out everything. You know, and then and then there's there's an entire like thing. So, and then whenever you want to um, you want to press a button, you you just select where you know the button that you're trying to select, and then you just double tap on the screen, and it'll go back. So so it's selecting. It selected the uh, the back button, so I just double tap anywhere on the screen, and it'll go back. Because the user doesn't know exactly where on the phone screen they are. You know, for them, it's just like, oh, it's the back button. Okay. Um, Security and location, screen lock, fingerprint, list of thirteen items. D does that kind of make sense? It's like you basically, and it gives the uh, the sign double tap to activate. So it's like it says what exactly the item is, and then it says the gives the option of what to do. So basically, you know, I, I explain that over here. I'm saying, hey, you know, these are the basic gestures. You, if you swipe right, you move to the next item. Swipe left, you move to the previous item. And then if you double tap, it actually opens that page up. And then you can swipe up or down in order to um, change the speed of your talkback. And then these are like more advanced gestures. If you want to go to the home screen, you know, swipe left and up, swipe right and up. Um, and then you can like pull to refresh to, so in terms of, so that's like more testing focus, you know, for QA devs, they're, they have to basically make sure that the app is, um, is accessible, you know, that people are able to click on buttons when they double tap, they're, they're able to hear that double tap to activate, you know, in order to open that other page. And then if it's a link, it says, you know, um, open this page link. It'll give you a hint. So uh, who here uses Xamarin Native? Xamarin Native? Xamarin Native? All right, a few people use Xamarin Native. Uh, this, is more, this is more deeper into the code. <clears throat> Android provides a library in its uh, accessibility class and essentially, if, if you open a page, you can make it focus somewhere. So uh, if you, generally whenever you open a screen and you want it to go to a certain part of the screen to start, you, all you gotta do is say, oh, all you gotta do is say, um, you know, announce. And it goes through the context and sees where exactly you want it to go, it finds the exact view and it you know makes the announcement basically accessibility event obtain and then event announcement. Um, so this is more you know we abstracted the announcement into a, a static class, a utility class essentially, um, and then you know focus. So basically you want to focus somewhere because the focus and announcement are two separate uh, activities. You can focus on something and it doesn't announce, and you can announce something and it doesn't focus. For example, if you uh, go to a, a different screen and you want the user to know what the screen, what screen they're going to, you can say announce, and then um, the billing page, and then it'll, it'll know uh, the, the user won't know that they're in the billing page now. And especially if um, if you have an image, images generally don't have text. Like if you when you develop code you know that images just have the image source file. They don't really have 
uh, you know, the, what the, it doesn't describe what the image does. You know, you can have the glyph icon for, for information, but the user doesn't know because he can't see that it's an information button. So we actually like tell it to announce that. <clears throat> for example, um, in our example, what we did is whenever you clicked on the, the right button, whenever you go to the next page in a calendar, we wanted it to focus on the, uh, the month and the year. So as soon as, as soon as you click on you know, the, the, the right arrow, we wanted the user to hear December 2018. So we'd focus December 2018 and we'd announce December 2018. So it's just stuff that, it, it's easy for you know, us to do these things, but for a user, he doesn't know exactly what's going on. Um, in this particular case, that's exactly what I'm showing over here. I'm saying, hey, uh, as soon as you click on the next month, if you notice over here, click next month and then it'll you know, change the page, but it'll also announce the current month.txt and it'll focus on the current month. Mm -hmm. you know? And like, I have this presentation up. Uh, I'll share it with you guys on my GitHub so you guys can see it. And then content description. This is, this is like really, really good for you guys to implement. Like it's something that's simple to do, makes a ton of difference. So the right arrow over there, there was no content descri description like, the, um, like this one. It would just say IC underscore um, cone or something like that. And then and the same for the left arrow. It would say IC underscore cone Y. You know, so the user is like, IC underscore cone, November 2018, IC underscore cone, why? What's going on? So all you gotta do is set a content description on the image, you know? So we just set the content description to text next month button. That's it, you know? And it, it makes a world of a difference for users. Um, yeah, sometimes they will even say unlab unlabeled image, you know? So it's, it's very simple for users like us to actually implement. Just look for like content description or hint or stuff like that. Um, important for accessibility. So um, for people who have like touched AXML, uh, I know there are not a lot of people, but um, there are basically properties like there's a text property for the control, there's the, the gravity style, things like that. And then there's just important for accessibility. Is this, um, is this element important for accessibility or not? So um, we, you know, according to accessibility standards, we don't want to read uh, the, the days of the, the week. You know, as soon as you go to November 2018, you know it's November 2018. The user doesn't need to, you know, when you swipe right, what's the point of going through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then going to the days? You know, that's definitely not important for accessibility. Yeah, it would make sense if every time you went on this, it would say 5th November, Monday, you know? But that's not what was going on. So we basically just set important for accessibility to false, to no. So, so pretty simple stuff, you know, it's not very complicated but it makes a huge difference. <clears throat> so then there's another thing called Accessibility Manager. Um, what we noticed is, we, so we had an issue that was just breaking our heads. It was like, um, we had implemented this calendar view. Calendar views, for those of you who have you know, touched Android, they're not, they're not native to Android. And so what happens is that you have to make it from scratch. And when you make something from scratch, you have to take into account accessibility as well. But a lot of people don't, people suck. So you just use these li libraries and they, they, you know, they suck with accessibility. And then you're, you, know, you have this application that you know, when, you, uh, when you test it with an accessibility tester, they're just like cross, cross, cross. So what we noticed when we were digging through it, that YouTube, for example, if your accessibility is on, if your talkback is on, 
it changes the view from this. This is what the standard view that we see. Is that it? So it changes the view from this to this for accessibility reasons. And it doesn't, it always keeps this screen there. Because they're not really watching, they're mostly hearing. So it keeps the screen there and they can actually like skip 10 seconds forward, 10 seconds back. And so the accessibility manager helps us do that, where it just checks to see whether or not accessibility is on. If it's on, then hide something, you know? So if you look at it, it doesn't say the date. It used to say date Monday, November 5th. It doesn't say that anymore. So we just hid it because, you know, there was, there was an issue over there. So, uh, and then live regions. Um, sometimes when, um, when you have a form and you, um, you fill out the wrong month, you, you, you fill out the wrong um, phone number, you know, you have 11 digits in, instead of just 10. So what you can set, you can set the live region for text field and it, to, you know, to true or to what? Yeah, polite. And there's, there's a few different, yeah, assertive, polite, and non. So that <clears throat> it will give you an error message and it'll announce that error message if it's displayed. So it'll say, oh, you know, you filled out 11 digits, fix it. You know, so it's, it's pretty neat that way. And then there's the accessibility delegate. Each, all views have their own accessibility delegate. You can override that and it'll, you know, override the, the default functionality of that view. So you can, you can go really, really deep. Um, that's all I had to present in terms of the presentation, I'll give you, I'll show a quick video. Um, the audio will be kind of soft, so just bear with me. Come on, let's make it. Um, here. I wasn't sure which one to present. I was like, should I present Apple Business Chat or should I present Android Accessibility? So I, I just chose Android Accessibility. It's really useful. Thank you. Really um, so this basically, you know, it has the presentation and it, I placed a video um, link here. So I'm gonna expand and uh, so you guys are aware what's going on over here. I kind of explained it with the PDF, but you guys can hear it now. So, so what I'm trying to do is I'm tr basically trying to make sure that when you go to the previous month, it focuses and announces November 2018. Previous month button, sell this, sell this previous month button, December 2018. Previous month button, November 2018. Cancel, payment amount, payment date the 6th of November, November 2018. Page your description. Yeah. So um, basically, it focused on uh, it announced November 2018. As soon as you open the uh, the the payment date, it announced November 2018 is the month that you're looking at, and it's going through the different days of the month. Um, and oh, okay. Quickly, I know a lot of people use Xamarin forms, so I was like, okay, let me bring in some Xamarin forms because you guys like Xamarin forms. Um, sadly, I, I don't want to get you guys too excited. So Xamarin forms and A11Y Toronto meetup as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, none, oh. Yeah, so you guys noticed that Xamarin forms did by default say, hey, welcome to Xamarin Forms button, double tap to activate. But nothing else is accessible on this page. You can't tap on the text over there or on the image uh, specifically by itself. So it's bad accessibility by default. Yeah, it so definitely needs to be fixed if it's Xamarin uh, Forms. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Random. So that blog post that was announcing it, when was it from? Uh, a while ago. Uh, 
That was a while ago, 2016? Yeah, 2016. Oh. Yeah, I know, I know. It sucks that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so really quick about iOS accessibility is very different and it's it's kind of more complicated, but it's it's its own you know its own ball game. Yeah. So yeah, you can have an accessibility expert, but not an iOS expert for accessibility. Like in in my previous project, there was a guy. He was really really good at iOS, like Swift, Objective C. He had done it all, and he was master coder. But when it came to iOS accessibility, he just couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, and then I, I gave this presentation on Android accessibility to them, and he was taking up Android accessibility stories <laughs> after that. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, let, let me finish this off. So he, he was doing Android accessibility stuff, but still no iOS. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, thank you. Just making the this picture bigger. No problem. All right, go for it. All right, yeah. All right, we're good. Yeah. All right, so all fantastic presentations, by the way. They were great. Um, I did learn one thing new for the Xamarin forums is the uh, the list view and selection none, because I always do it the other way, where you listen to the event handler. So, yeah. Which is, I guess, the old way now. Yeah. Um, so that's why I like coming out to these. But what I wanted to talk to you about was quick and dirty offline support. Uh, so what exactly does that mean? Uh, so I'm Mark. I own Redbit. We're a uh, we develop mobile apps, cloud-based mobile apps, and web applications for various customers. Myself, uh, I'm a 15-year Microsoft MVP, currently in the Visual Studio category. Uh, I'm also a Xamarin University certified trainer, and unfortunately, the Xamarin University is going away. Uh, there's a few mugs there that uh, they sent me. Um, I've been working with Xamarin for a long time. Uh, Xamarin Forms is fantastic. I do do the native stuff too, uh, but I'd rather do Xamarin Forms because it's just easier uh, to get things done quicker. Wait, Xamarin University shut it down? Yeah. It's going to Microsoft Learn. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's transitioning, rebranding. Uh, you'll notice the blog is changing to mobile developer, I think, or mobile dev. Yeah, like they removed the Xamarin branding. Yeah. So like it's more it generic sad. right now. Yeah, it's more generic. So <laughs> it's unfortunate. It's a, it's a sad day, at least for me. Uh, but I still got a few monkeys. So. Um, okay, so let's get to it. I didn't have a presentation, but everybody here inspired me to put one together. So I did put one. It's only four slides. Um, who am I who did that? I'm gonna give you the scenario, gonna show you some code. Then I'll have a slide on the tools that I use, all the open source projects, and where to learn more. So, 
the scenario. You're building an application, customer comes to you, says, uh, you know, we, we need the application to work when there's no internet connection and you're almost done developing. And you're like, okay, you know, we need to talk about this and give you a the minimum viable project uh, product uh, to go to production and then we'll enhance it later. So this is where this came from. Uh, the quick and dirty kind of offline support. It's not as extensive as yours, as Daniel's, uh, where we're using SQLite. Under the covers, we do use SQLite, and I'll show you how. Uh, but I will get out of this and go straight into the code. So in this sample application, I uh, took the scenario of using a company directory app, uh, just uh, JSON data that gets downloaded from a uh, REST API, and we show uh, some information there. Uh, so we have uh, right here, again, quick and dirty. I just threw in some files. We have our main page, we have our view model, we have our model. I didn't separate anything out. I put it all into one project up here. But I will run this on my device. So it's just one service call? One service call at this point, yeah. Um, so you could do it for uh, what I'm doing here. I'll show you the view model. And basically we have one method here. It just says an HTTP request, nothing fancy, HTTP client. Uh, grabs the JSON data and sets it to this team member's variable. The model is just first name, last name, avatar, so we can show the, the image, and an ID. So very simple. Uh, this should be deploying soon, So I pre-compiled it for coming up. Uh, and then the UI is a list, I, I just got a label in here uh, that just shows a subtitle, and then a list view showing the, the actual data. This is where I have that code, so we don't see the nice orange uh, highlight from Android, which is the default color. Uh, so this is the kind of hack that you put together. But apparently now you could do, just this, uh, what was the property? Separate, uh, selected or something. Selection mode, there we go. And this uh, IntelliSense in XAML is fantastic. So I don't have to remember anything, you just type. Uh, and apparently you could do this now, none, selection mode, none. Um, but I'm not gonna screw up my, my flow here and go off script. Uh, I got Visor here, here's our application. I'm running on my device. Um, I'm using something called FF image load, uh, which is fast and furious image load. Um, and it's just a cached image, so it'll do all the caching and download the file and all that fun stuff. Uh, so. As a developer, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, and th that's the crux of it. So imagine you know, you're ready to deploy and customers say, hey, we need this to work offline. So of course you agree because you know, we developers love our challenges. So I'm going to go into demo two and say no, I'm just gonna switch over to this branch and I'll give you an overview of what was changed. So I included a library called Xamarin Essentials. So if you've never used Xamarin Essentials, uh, I started looking at accessibility here, just because I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Xamarin Essentials is just a bunch of um, platform-specific code. Uh, if you've been doing Xamarin for a long time, you probably have all this code. Uh, they brought it all together into one library that's open source and you could do things. I use connectivity, but you could grab the compass, the clipboard, uh, like all these things you could do, which is, uh, which is great. So I just added that to the project. And then what I've done is I've added this, uh, this task just to start retrieving the data when the, uh, the view model loads. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom, I just look for this, just so it's bigger, if there's an internet connection. Now one thing to be aware of here is 
you might, it might give you, it's going to say it might have network access as internet, but you might not actually have internet access, so I do have it to do here that you probably need to check and have a try-catch uh, block in here. But so far, if you put it in, in the demo in this use case, it, it does work. Um, so I will again, deploy this. From a UI perspective, so you just so you just check for internet connectivity, and then what did you do in order to store the information? I'm not there yet. That's, okay. that's the next part. Okay. Uh, so so basically, what, what right now what I'm doing is I'm just showing an error message if there is no uh, connection. Sure. Um, if there is a connection, then I go ahead and do the same thing that we did last time: download okay. the data and show it to the user. Still no caching at this point. Um, and then I did add a error message label here, so I threw it in the stack panel under the subtitle. If there's an error, dump it in here. So I will let this build. This is one of the challenges of uh, development and deploying and live running. It does take a while to build. I think whether you're on Windows or on Mac, um, it does take a while. I think iOS, though, if you have a Mac, it's, it's pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why I need to walk around with my Mac more. <laughs> uh, so any questions while we wait for this? Does anyone have to build offline support? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm sure you did it with that SQLite. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's, it, it could be, it could be a pain. Yeah, like I said, this is quick and dirty. Um, I mean, we had to do one where we had to do data synchronization yeah. and build our own sync. Yeah. Uh, it was a pain and all that SQLite stuff. And yeah. Or there are operations as well, like sending oh, yeah. back um, if you have structured data, right? Yeah. You can't just insert everything. You have to go in order, right? Yeah, and you have to see conflicts yeah. and yeah. The, the whole bit. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah. That's why, like, Basically, I, I have a little diagram I show customers. I go, okay, here's your app budget with no offline support. Yeah. <laughs> here's your app with just like offline caching, so read only. Yeah. And then here's your budget with your offline sync. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then so they always go for the first one. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's finally deploying. So let's try to get this. Mark, do you have the new uh, Android uh, packaging and deployment options turned on? The RA then? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. I usually don't like to do that in the middle of projects. Anything critical? Yeah. Yeah, because something breaks. It's uh, has gotten better though. Has less it? Less things are breaking. All right. Less frequently. So far less frequently. Yeah, I've been scarred too many times. I know. I was I had PTSD for a long time. So. <laughs> okay, so here we have our uh, same application. I am going to go into airplane mode. Uh, you'll see there I have a label. One of the things I did do is I have a uh, open the view model an event handler just to show if there's if the connection has changed or not. Um, and here, if we refresh, no internet connection available. And then if I kill the app, and find it down here, it should just come up and say no internet connection. Oh. All right, so there it should just come up and show no internet connection available when you restart the app. And then even if the user tries to refresh, uh, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, next step is let's add, I'm going to skip to right here. Um, the last part is just improving the, the UX. What I'm gonna do is just walk through the code uh, and show you what I did. So we'll add some caching now. Uh, at the same time, I am going to 
deploy this and hopefully it doesn't break. Uh, what I'm using for caching is it's called monkey cache. So it sounds like a, you know, uh, not a great tool. It's actually pretty fantastic. It's still in beta. Um, I don't know what the progress is of it. It's uh, by James Montemango and uh, I think Frank Kruger is involved in that one too. Um, it's there. I feel it works. Uh, it is in beta. Uh, you can use it. We're using it in production. Yeah, um, I use it, too. it seems to work. Yeah. yeah. So it does what it's supposed to. Do. Exactly. It, it caches data. So a couple things to be aware of is I'm using the SQLite. So you just had the NuGet package. You find Monkey Cache. Make sure you put it into uh, pre-release mode. Uh, I can't go into it right now, but it will only show up in pre-release mode. So search for monkey dash cache, uh, enable pre-release, and then you'll be able to find it. Uh, the other thing you gotta do is you gotta initialize it with an app ID right here. It's fairly simple. Uh, so I just put it in, I threw it in the app.xaml. And then in our view model, I'll just scroll to the bottom. So all the code essentially stays the same, except here. So if we don't have an internet connection, I just have this helper method that just goes and grabs um, the cache data. If the data is there and if it's not expired, I return the cache data. If it's expired, I just return a null. And then back at the top up here where we actually use it, I just put the appropriate error message. So if there's no internet connection, no cache data, I put that. If there is a uh, error message, but we're using cache data, and then I just set our, um, our property, which will update the, the UI, and then set this to false. Do you have some GitHub? What was that? Do you have some GitHub? Uh, no, I just actually built it uh, in the past couple days. So I'll, I'll throw it up there okay. uh, on oh, GitHub. Um, could probably also do an article. Uh, I do have a, a readme of what exactly we're trying to do here. I just have to clean it up. So. If you want an article, I will take the time and build one. <laughs> All right. Uh, hopefully, this is useful. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's like I said, quick and dirty yeah. uh, to get it done. Now, here's where the actual caching happens um, is right here. So we still get our data. Uh, so we read the string, uh, async, grab the data, we parse it. Uh, the, the service that I'm using is a little bit different. I'm using this one here. Um, I just found this request response. And the data that comes back is, uh, let me zoom in here, right here. So we want to grab this node, uh, the, this array of data. At this point, we don't care about this just for the, the purposes of the, the demo and sample. So I just parsed the, uh, the JSON object grab the data, and then grab the string, and then deserialize that to uh, the list of team members. Well, once we have that data, then I just add it in here uh, to the cache, and I give it an expires time of one day. Uh, so you could set this to a time span, you could do to whatever. Um, in our scenario that we did for the customer, uh, they wanted to, uh, to cache FAQ data. Uh, so they wanted the FAQ data to work whether online or offline. Uh, you know, simple requirement. Uh, well, that was the first step. Um, we had it to 10 days. Because FAQs doesn't change much, right? So, what is uh, it? Request response? What is that again? Uh, REQ, R-E-S, dot it. What do I do? Thank you. I put the computer to sleep. <laughs> you know, when you think you're going to be 15 minutes, maybe do something like that. All right. Thank God for SSD. Let's see if this comes back up. Duplicate. So it's REQ, RES dot in. And. You might have to plug it directly in. Like, 
uh, just take it in and out? Yeah, try that first. Yeah. And uh, if that doesn't work, I'll plug it directly into the projector. So we still got you run it through the capture, which isn't even working. So. Yeah. All right. Let's give up on that. Here. Okay. Plug this one in directly. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, I was apologizing for somebody else's technology fit. Uh, I put the computer to sleep. It would, would be fine if I didn't do that. When you think you know your keyboard shortcuts. All right. Okay, there it comes. So, so where does it cache the data in SQLite database? So yeah, so I'm using the one that is SQLite. Uh, where, where did you use? Under the hood, uh, um, Monkey Cache uses SQLite. So yeah. what it does is it, it will fetch the the. So on SQLite, it will have actually like the URL you requested. Yeah. So whenever you query that URL again, it yeah. will know that that URL retrieves that data. Yeah. So it will like Monkey Cache will retrieve that locally cached data for you. So is it is it just normal SQL or is it encrypted? Uh, it's normal SQL, okay. so it's, it's not encrypted. Uh, one way we got around that is we encrypted the string ourselves. Uh, not the best, but uh, we didn't have time to go and modify monkey cash. Uh, but yeah, that would be that would be a nice one to to have in there. But <coughs> monkey cash also has support for. What's up? Uh, you can save to file store or LightDB. So those are the, the ones that you can do at this point. I default to SQLite. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so the encryption, yeah, so don't store sensitive information in there because yeah. you'll be able to, uh, to grab it. So, okay, now it's back here. So this is where we were. You got your cache data, store it in there. So right now we are running the application. Let me run Visor again. Let that connect. So you see, I still have it in airplane mode. So no, no internet connection and no cache data. So I'm going to put it in take off airplane mode. And you'll notice what I did add is a little kind of just improve the experience a little bit. Uh, right here, I just go in and ask the user if you want, hey, we got a connection, do you want to load the data? So that way the user doesn't have to manually refresh. Mm -hmm. So then we go in, we load the data, we're good to go. It's not, it's not sure. <laughs> well, we loaded the data, good to go. So right now we're in, in things, so let me kill this. Go back to airplane mode and fill the loss up again. Yeah. So there, no internet connection, but using cache data. Uh, even if we refresh, um, you know, it'll still show us the data. And if we take it out of airplane mode, it'll recognize that, hey, you got an internet connection, and there's a dialog box I was, uh, I was talking about. So click yes, it'll refresh. The message and the notification at the top is gone. And we are good to go. And now we have new cache data. So that in a nutshell is quick and dirty support to offline cache. Uh, again, not extensive. Caching only web requests. Uh, it really depends on, on uh, your specific scenario and what you need to cache. So you could get very complex SQLite caching, sync with SQL data, um, that again, like Dylan said, time and budget just goes a lot higher. So the tools I used, just go very quickly. Um, there we go. Xamarin Forms, I think it's 3.4, not 3.5. Um, eventually, I'll get it upgraded. Uh, FF Image Load, that's for the icon or the uh, the profile image you see on the left side. 
uh, of the user, Xamarin Essentials, Monkey Cache, and I use request rec res.in, which I just found, and I'm going to be looking at JSON Generator because uh, we could get more data. So that is essentially it. Some items and links to, to look at. Doesn't really fit at the bottom, but I'll have this available somewhere. Um, these are some of the Twitter people you probably want to follow, uh, including Dylan and Daniel and uh, the group here. Uh, but obviously Xamarin HQ, not much comes from there. Uh, Maybe going away, I don't know, uh, with the new branding. Uh, but James Montemango, Mikhail Bukaza, David Ortnow, which uh, you guys mentioned. Uh, Pierce, I think he's the VS and, and Xamarin uh, PM. Uh, if you're into App Insights, which is a fantastic product, definitely recommend looking at that. Um, that is somebody else, and ping me later, and I'll send you who that is on Twitter, the program manager. Um, other places to look at, you'll see at the bottom, roadmap for Xamarin Forms. Uh, like I said, I, um, I love Xamarin Forms. Get the pointer on. Um, Xamarin Forms, you get the roadmap right here. Uh, the blog, it'll redirect you to the new one. Merge Conflict is a great podcast by um, uh, James uh, Montemango. Definitely take a look at that one. And the one at the bottom is just Channel 9, the Xamarin Show. Um, haven't seen anything lately from there. Have you guys seen anything? Yeah, I saw one uh, like an episode last week, I think. Is it last week? Yeah. Okay. Just a show. Oh, it was a compass one. That was really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I, I missed that he, one. He created compass and he put the code open. Okay. So you can create a compass very easily. I think it was showing off the essentials. Showing off the essentials. Oh, the Xamarin Essentials, yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. No, but it was just a very short, too. It was like five minutes long. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, and here's the slide where it fits everything. I made the font small. Yeah. And that is it. Um, so, any questions that you guys have? Not a problem. I asked so many. You asked, yeah, so. All right, well, thank you, everyone. You want this back, or? We got a shout out on, uh, because we stream, right now we got a shout out on the um, .NET Foundation community stand-up uh, last week, so it was kind of nice. Um, so thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Yeah. See you next month, right? 19th? Yeah. March? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thanks everybody. <laughs>